fourth week of reading from the book of Job. Four out of four. You may remember when we started, I was talking to you about how this story that is part of the Hebrew Bible is an ancient story, predating Judaism. A story that comes out of the Babylonian gods and their story. So that when the Jews were in captivity in Babylon and they heard the story about, well, his name at the time was Sadil Kinam Mubib. I just love saying that. <laughs> but how when they heard these stories about Sadil Kinam Mubib, they, they heard a holy message. And they realized that this was something that they could tell if they tweaked the story a bit. And so that first week, we got the story of God and the accuser arguing over Job and whether he would be faithful if the blessings dried up. We find in the second reading, Job suffering, scraping off the boils from his skin with the posture. Ouch. We didn't read the part about his children being killed about his flocks being destroyed and taken by marauding enemies, about his servants being wiped out with the refrain, and I alone have survived to tell you. We did read the part where Job's friends came and sat with him, where they heard his complaints and all was well until they opened their mouths to try and explain just why all this was happening telling him that it was because of his sin. We heard Job's complaint to God, asking God for a hearing. Last week, we heard God's response, asking, where were you when I created the earth? Can you measure with a line all of creation? Can you draw out the Leviathan with a hook? Do you know where the mother lion is? feeds her young. And today, we take a final look at the book of Job. Job, who has heard God's response, who has been reminded of his own finiteness, finitude, yes, that's the word. We find Job struggling. Struggling with his own feelings, but overwhelmed by the greatness of God and saying, you know, I shouldn't have opened my mouth. I didn't understand what I was asking, but now I see. I see that I can't know and understand why things happen. And so I will just put my trust in you. And God then responds responds by once more blessing Job as the story draws to its end. Restoring to him not just the few animals that he had, but giving him massive flocks of sheep and donkeys and camels. Wealth beyond imagining in the Middle Eastern world of his day. Instead of the children who had died, he now has ten more. Seven sons and three daughters. Now, I, I must say as an aside, when we read the story, we need to realize that this is a story told in an age of patriarchy. Where the story of Job is just the story of one man, and all those children are really props. They're symbols of God's blessing. If we read it too literally and get into the children who were killed or the children who were born, it becomes much less of a happy feeling story at the end. But these props, these, these symbols of blessing, are how the story ends. With Job seeing his children and grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren. Four generations that he gets to see as they are born and come into the world. Signs of blessing. Signs of restoration because of his faithfulness. 
Because even though Job complained, even though Job shaked, shake, shook his fist, I can talk American goodly, really. <laughs> but even though Job shook his fist at God, he remained faithful. He didn't turn his back and walk away. He asked questions. He found answers he couldn't understand. But he continued to journey with God. That journey is a hard one. And this week we certainly find ourselves understanding a bit of it. As yesterday we saw Jewish sisters and brothers gunned down in their synagogue as they gathered for a rest. Faithful people meeting their end at the hands of a domestic terrorist. We don't understand. We shake our fists at God. How can this happen? We may think we know some answers, and we probably do know some. After all, anti-Semitism is one of those sins that has plagued Christianity from the beginning. Today we celebrate Reformation Sunday, and we, we talk about Martin Luther. But if you read Martin Luther's writings, you will see that he was very likely anti-Semitic. That it was the writings of Martin Luther that the Nazis held on to to justify, at least in their own minds, the Shoah, the Holocaust. It's something that we wrestle with. We confess our sin. We commit to God that we will do better, that we will speak up whenever we find people oppressed. There will be voices for love and tolerance. That we will help show a new and better way. We work for the restoration of God's Word. For the restoration of relationships. For the restoration of justice. We find that story echoing across the ages through the Hebrew Scriptures, through the New Testament as well. And this morning we find a similar restoration story with blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, Bar meaning son of. And Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, sitting there by the roadside waiting for Jesus to pass by. Hearing the commotion, as Jesus and his followers got closer and closer, listening as the sound of the crowd swelled, swole. Really, that English thing, I can do it. <laughs> but listening as, as Jesus came by and as the sound grew louder, and finally hearing that this was his opportunity. Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on me, he cried out. The son of Timaeus, calling out the son of David. And that beggar who sat there, the one whose given name we don't know, but whose lineage we do, found himself called forward. As the crowd said, hey, the rabbi is calling you. And he leapt up and threw off his beggar's cloak. The cloak that he would have spread out in front of him in his lap to catch the coins that people might have tossed his way. Timaeus left up, or Timaeus' son leapt up. And I can imagine the coins scattering as he did so. He went forward. And Jesus asked him one question. What would you have me do for you? It seems like a question that 
Jesus didn't need to ask. It seems like the kind of question that Jesus should have already known the answer. But I think it's important that he asked. Because when we can formulate what it is that we need, when we can offer our brokenness to God in so many words, then we can be changed. And the son of Timaeus asked, I want you to restore my sight. And that's what happened. And then the scripture tells us that Bartimaeus left everything behind to follow Jesus. But you know, we, we come to these scripture texts a little bit at a time each week. We miss the grand sweep of the story. This is taking place in Jericho, just outside of Jerusalem. As Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem at the end of Mark's Gospel, the only thing that is left is the cross. So for Bartimaeus to follow Jesus these last few steps, is a mark of suffering. He left behind his blindness. He had no vision. And I guarantee you that was metaphorical as well as physical. And with that new vision, followed open eye to Jerusalem and Jesus. It's the kind of restoration that changes people. The restoration that gives new sight, that gives new insight, that gives us a new mission. As God's people, we find restoration throughout our lives. The restoration when things finally go right after so many years of wrongness. Those times that we find like Job, when things once more are working. Because eventually they do. That restoration of vision, when we look around us, perhaps for the first time, and see that things aren't exactly as we've always thought. Today, as God's very own people, we find our eyes open. We find new visions permeating our minds and our consciousness. We find a call to action in a world that is broken. Where bombs in the mail and gunshots in a synagogue are a reality. But we're called to live, to speak, to love differently, to reach out for wholeness. Holding hands with those who are different from us. And saying, no longer. Our faith calls us to be active. Because a passive faith that is just about Jesus loves me. Without realizing that Jesus calls us to love one another. Doesn't cut it. And we know that. Let us then, as God's very own people, stand up, speak up, and share the love of God with those who are different from ourselves as we build a society where God's will and God's love are tangible. May it be so. Amen. Thank you.